talk. Sean's our second talker for this uh, session. I met Sean last year. He was a great mentor for my master's project. Uh, Sean uh, received his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of New South Wales, uh, Australia. He's currently an instructor at the Martino Centre for Biomedical Imaging, uh, Harvard Medical School, and a research affiliate at Sales MIT. Previously, he was a postdoc at Stanford University. Um, in 2016, he was a visiting researcher at uh, Interdigital Communications, San Diego. He received the APRS slash IAPR Best Paper Award at uh, DICTA 2018 together with uh, David Taubman. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right, well, thank you for the uh, introduction. And yeah, I just want to preface this talk by saying I'm not really a medical imaging person. So some of the things that, you know, like Robin asked me, well, how does this work in the city? I'm like, I have no idea, right? So um, having said that, I think there's always room in like science for people to contribute in different ways. And sort of that's what I hope to bring to the table today. Um, so my talk is entitled uh, Fully Convolutional Slice the Volume Reconstruction for Single Stack MRI. So Basically, this is like a one minute version of my entire talk. So you have like a, a stack of 2D MR slices. Um, again, there are situations where you have to have acquisitions like this. And of course, um, this is a mostly axial uh, scan, right, acquisition. And of course, if you look at it from this kind of view, then you don't really see anything. Um, there's a partial volume effect, of course, but there's a lot of interspliced motion which means um, you know, if you want to do sort of uh, tackle for their downstream tasks, you know, volume, volumetry and stuff like that, there's really no way to kind of make that work if you have a slice stack like this. So what I do is basically turn that into a um, reconstruct an underlying MR volume out of that. So that's my, the, you know, so you can kind of switch off and uh, I guess we've kind of seen the, uh, the entire talk. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'll be breaking it down for you, of course, but um, that's basically it. And um, I mean, as a computer vision person, what better examples are than stereo disparity estimation, right? So in computer vision, there's this thing called, um, you know, stereo disparity estimation where you're tasked with kind of trying to find, estimate the sort of the depth map given sort of two views of the same scene, right? So if I kind of uh, go back and forth between the right and left views, this is sort of what it looks like. And of course, you can estimate from those two views a disparity field, which is uh, one upon depth uh, field like this, right? And that's possible because, you know, if you look at the epipolar sort of geometry, then what is the ray of light? And one view is actually um, not the problem line in the other view, right? So, of course, now if you can kind of uh, find the correspondence between, say, for example, this point here and um, this point here, which is actually seen as movement along this line, then you're good to go in terms of um, estimating disparity, right? And if you go uh, one upon disparity, estimate the best of that, right? So, why do I bring this up? Well, because sort of people were. So by people, I mean deep learning people were like, oh, um, do we actually need those two views to um, estimate disparity? Why not just use a unit on a single view, right? And um, so this is called monocular disparity estimation or monocular depth estimation, where they try to go from one view to sort of the underlying depth map, right? And uh, it turns out that if you just use like a standard unit to do this, then it kind of actually works pretty well. So um, so what people have been able to do is kind of stuff like this, right? So you have like the scene, uh, a scene that you want to estimate the, the depth field for. And if you basically throw at a unit, a whole lot of these sort of um, single view uh, disparity field pairs, then actually the unit is able to generalize to, uh, 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 you know, uh, to predict correctly the depth maps for unseen views as well, right? So, um, well, the joys of um, deep learning, yes, yeah. right? And so I looked at this, and this was kind of before I joined Martinez, right? So this was 
kind of very hot, I think, in uh, Vlad and Colton at Intel Labs, uh, his group, where he kind of pioneered some of these techniques. And um, I was thinking, okay, well, uh, this is great. But then I, I joined the Martino Center and then uh, some of the people there and uh, MIT as well, they uh, were actually working on slice to volume reconstruction, right? Where basically uh, the problem is to go from a stack of MR slices to like the underlying volume, right? And so I was thinking, okay, well, you know, people are using multiple slice stacks to kind of piece them together into a MR volume. Can I actually do this using uh, a single slice stack? The way that people are doing uh, disparity estimation based on a single view, right? And so that's kind of what led to this research project. So like I was saying, you know, like people doing fetal imaging, this is, you know, they, they need this tech to work, right? Because, you know, um, if, if you're trying to, uh, you know, take an MRI scan of like uh, fetus in the mother's womb, then obviously you can't exactly sedate the fetus or anything, right? Um, and you can't tell the fetus to like keep still, right? So, um, but having said that, I'm not really a fetal person and I kind of don't really care about you know, improving the quality of care for mothers, expecting mothers. I mean, I do a little bit, but um, that's not where I come from, right? And I, I was just uh, very interested in solving the problem itself because you know that's what computer science are known for, right? Like, they, like they, they, they think they're somehow better than the others, better than others, and then oh, I think I can do this better, right? So I'm a little bit guilty of having that kind of mindset as well. But anyhow, that's how I got started on working on this problem. So essentially what we try to do is to estimate or predict a stack of motion fields per slice from a single stack of 2D slices. And now that you have your motion stack estimated, you can kind of use that to warp your original stack of slices and sort of interpolate the result um, so that you get a nice 3D reconstruction like this. Right. So, right. So, um, so that's kind of the backdrop for this talk. And what I'm actually supposed to have started with is to mention that in high resolution 3D MRI of subjects exhibiting severe and trouble motion, you kind of have to use something like um, FFS SE uh, acquisition to kind of you know freeze the motion and plane and then sort of now you try to piece the sort of the MR slices together to form the 3D whole right so this would be my official introduction but because I'm not a medical imaging person I decided to go with the disparity one right, so if you have these uh, 2D sort of bathed acquisitions then this is kind of uh, slice stacks that you end up with, right? So obviously this is an axial acquisition. So if you look at each of these slices axially from an axial uh, view, then they look okay. But the moment you kind of step aside and look at it uh, from uh, the two uh, orthogonal directions, they look, uh, you know, terrible, right? So what people have been doing using optimization is to basically acquire sort of three orthogonal stacks, right? Slice stacks. And then they try to kind of put them together, sort of piece them together so that, uh, you know, this is essentially the slice to volume registration thing that uh, Ishvan also talked about, right? So it's, it's exactly the same tech. Um, they try to sort of harmonize the three different stacks so that you can have this um, 3D, so that you can reconstruct this three underlying 3D volume, right? Um, and so this is like a typical pipeline that most of these methods would use. So you acquire essentially sort of three orthogonal SS FSC uh, stacks of so single shot fast spin echo uh, sequences. Um, and then now that you have those three stacks, you would kind of, kind of, you know, sort of uh, scatter all of the voxel data, voxel information into an original uh, sorry, a uh, low resolution initial volume. And then now you kind of ping pong back and forth between, you know, 
uh, re-estimating the motion and uh, you know refining the uh, reconstruction until you somehow converge, right? I mean, all of this is a non-convex, non-linear problem. So uh, you do this until you think you have converged. And um, now that you have an estimate of the underlying volume, you can super resolve it, right? So this is kind of the, the sort of the pipeline that most of these approaches use, right? And so many of these uh, approaches work very well. Uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to knock this, these methods, but they are iterative. And so you're using something like, uh, I guess, uh, conjugate gradients, I guess, in many cases. So they are pretty slow. And you know these methods aren't things you can use during scan for like perspective motion estimation and that kind of stuff. So um, I, I think uh, if I remember correctly, this uh, methods like these, uh, this take maybe, tens of minutes. Uh, I mean, depending on whether it's on CPU or GPU, I, I don't know, but it, it'll take minutes basically. Right. So, um, and this is another method from Alina Us and others in uh, 2020. And so again, it's very sort of uh, flow chart driven, right? So have things converged and if, ha if they haven't, then you kind of go back and okay, let's reinitialize the, the volume and then um, so again, these methods can be pretty slow. And um, what happened last year was, um, so at MIT, this, uh, so Jinshan, uh, who has graduated now, uh, his uh, thesis was, was around doing all of this using uh, vision transformers, right? So vision transformers, of course, um, he, he gets stellar results um, actually uh, using vision transformers. But then if you have a look at this, there's a lot of sort of disjoint components here as well. There is the, uh, you know, the sort of the, trend, uh, the transformer model that is responsible for estimating the motion uh, parameters for each individual slice, as well as kind of another transform model that will uh, estimate the volume. And then he kind of does this in an uh, iterative manner where again, you uh, kind of take one step uh, of uh, motion estimation and then followed by volume estimation and then go back to re-estimate the motion and so on and so forth. Um, but then my, you know, me speaking as a computer vision person, I was like, okay, well, can you not do this using like a fully convolutional architecture? Because so far I have not come across a, like a vision task where you can solve the problem only using transform models, right? So. Because it seems, it seemed to me back then, like there's nothing between like very traditional approaches where you have to use uh, numerical optimization and something that is on the bleeding edge, like um, vision transformers, right? Because the uh, UNET, UNET has been sort of the mainstay of medical vision analysis for many years now, right? So why is there nothing in the middle between these sort of two extremes, right? So that's when I kind of started to work on this. And um, so as a first step at making this fully convolutional, you might think, okay, well, let's just try to regress like a 3D volume against like the slice stack. Cause you know, if you stack the 2D slices together it's kind of like a volume, right? So can you just go from a slice stack to a 3D volume and you have a unit to do this, right? So it's like an image to image uh, reconstruction model. And um, well, it turns out that it doesn't work if you do that, because if you think about the, the, the nature of these 2D slices, they're heavily motion corrupted, right? So, and um, so this is actually a registration problem rather than a denoising problem, which, uh, or, or a segmentation problem for that matter, which uh, a unit is great for, right? So, so uh, this doesn't work. And, um, and so, we essentially, like I said at the beginning of this talk, we want to use something like a unit to um, basically estimate the slice motion and then kind of use that to do the 3D reconstruction. And um, yeah, so for that, we had to kind of go back to the roots of how optimization approaches work. And they essentially have you know, one thing nice 
about optimization approaches is that they have a really nice mathematical forward model, right? So there was a lot to learn from how these, uh, you know, how these, uh, you know, what the forward model is so that we can translate that into a fully convolutional setup. And so without having to understand too much about, I mean, there's not really much there. So if you have like a, say an underlying volume V, sort of that's like the, uh, the unknown, right? Because uh, if you had the V, then you wouldn't be doing any of this. Um, so the Ford model assumes that at time K, that volume V is rigidly, uh, you know, goes through rigid motion. And then of course, there's sort of um, a sort of an acquisition slice, ac slice based acquisition at time K, which is kind of like a convolutional process, right? So, um, you know, depending on uh, whether you're at time zero, one, two, three, four, five, you know, the slicing, sort of the slicing plane will kind of translate across the longitudinal axis of uh, the subject. And that's how you end up with like a slice at time K, right? So this F K is basically your 2D slice at time K and uh, V is the volume that we're trying to uh, estimate. So in linear algebra, it's super nice, right? Um, so basically you just get this uh, model where, uh, you know, the underlying volume goes through some motion and then gets sliced. And uh, if you stack all of these 2D slices together, then you get this uh, F, right? Okay, so um, this is, although previous authors haven't really expressed what, whatever they're doing this way, um, it turns out that you can write whatever uh, you know optimization approaches do as this kind of alternating optimization problem, right? So, um, and uh, so it, I'm not going to bore you with the details of these equations, but it turns out that the probably the the harder the more difficult step is to estimate the motion of the individual slices rather than uh, you know, using the motion to reconstruct sort of the 3D volume because, you know, I mean, I, I think Paul also knows, knows this, right? Like this is, all of this is very non-convex, but the using the motion to reconstruct the volume is like completely convex, right? It's, you just have to warp all these different slices using the, the estimate of the motion you have and that you're done, right? So that's why we kind of realized that if we can go from a slice stack um, regress a motion stack against a slice stack, then we should be good to go. And we came up with this uh, splat slice uh, unit architecture, which mimics the internal operations of these uh, U and the B steps in um, you know, traditional optimization based approaches. We rolled it all into our unit. And so, of course, now how do you train this thing? Then, well, so we would take these the sort of synthetic training approach very similarly to what Eugenio and everyone else has been have been doing. And um, so at training time, you can, you know, you have access to sort of reference or ground to 3D volumes, right? So you can kind of just come up with random but known motion to randomly kind of slice these uh, 3D volumes up. And so now you have these ground truth motions and the uh, sort of the slice stacks as a byproduct of the, uh, the augmentations that you do, right? And then now if you can kind of use the motion stack as your superposition signal and slice stack as your uh, input, then basically that's how you can train it. Except, um, you know, what we know about convolutional neural networks is that they're pretty bad at just translating stuff, right? Because it's all convolutional. So it doesn't see translation and it kind of also doesn't see rotations, right? Because you know, I mean, rotations, if you look at it at a very microscopic level, it's all very just translational, right? So we realized that getting um, our fully convolutional neural network model to stick things right in the middle of the field of view actually doesn't work because it's, it's just not capable of doing that. It's like you're in the uh, uh, deep in the middle of the, uh, the ocean and then sort of trying to ask yourself where I'm where about to I mean, all you see are like waves, right? So you don't really see any landmarks or anything like that. So when we train these things, we just factor out sort of the global rotation and translation components of the difference 
uh, the motion between whatever we have predicted and the ground truth uh, motion stack that we're supervising all of this with. And of course, uh, if you do all of this right, then the, um, the volume that you end up reconstructing actually looks like this, this flat volume. So it's, it's got a whole lot of holes because remember like the subject is moving along with the, the acquisition process. So for example, if the subject is moving at the exact same speed as sort of like how your, your PR basically, then you're going to miss out on a whole lot of sort of, you know, you're gonna have regions with that are never captured, right? And in general, um, holes are like just an inevitable uh, part of uh, doing SDR. So, but what we can do is we can do, uh, you know, self-supervised interpolation, right? So if we can, if we have, we can have like a, another sort of pre-trained uh, unit model that can go from a flat volume, so warped volume using the, the motion that we predicted to something that is closer to the underlying 3D volume, we can use that as an interpolator, right? So what happens is we do the uh, motion estimation as a first step, and then using the motion estimate, uh, the estimated motion, we will have this volume that is warped, predicted. And then from the predict volume, we go sort of something that is closer to the 3D volume one, to filling in the holes basically. And so these are the uh, results that we get. So we also, oh, by the way, so although um, most of my customers, if you like, are going to be people doing fetal imaging, um, the one thing not so good about fetal data is the fact that they don't have ground truth volumes, right? Because um, unless you do it XP, I, I don't know how that's going to work, right? It's just not going to work, right? So, so we started by. Um, testing all of this on, on um, adult brain scans. Um, you know, uh, what are these? So Buckner 39, MCIC, all of these things. Um, and th these are kind of, this is the visualization of the results we get. So let me just show you. So let's start with this. So on the far left, you see the original slice back. Um, and that's what I'm here. And uh, yeah, so the, both of these are sort of sessional acquisitions. And if you do the sort of the splatting, splatting is just warping using the motion that we estimate, which is uh, this column here, then you correctly sort of reconstruct the, the underlying 3D volume with holes, right? Because you're supposed to get the holes as a byproduct of doing this. Um, and if you compare that to what you would get if you were to reconstruct these using the ground truth motion, uh, well, that's sort of this third column. So they're very similar. And um, like the fact that you get these holes reconstructed faithfully to look like sort of the, the, the ones that you would get if you were to use the ground truth motion kind of gives us a lot of confidence that this is working. And of course, you don't want to give those this kind of results to radiologists because they are not going to be happy with whatever you're giving them. So now if you interpolate across the, the missing regions, then you get something a lot nicer like this. So I guess in many cases, it might be hallucinating the pixel intensities in the missing regions. But remember, there's actually, if you kind of step outside of this plane, then there's, you know, um, the holes aren't actually that big because there's uh, intensity data in the plane that is right in front of this and the uh, slice that is in front of this and the ones behind it, right? So this is more like interpolation rather than um, in painting. And um, you'll see that whatever results we get after interpolation, they're uh, you know, pretty good approximations of the true volume. And um, we did the same with uh, fetal acquisitions. So, I'll show you these two. So um, there's this public data set uh, called FETA, which uh, give you um, uh, basically reference reconstruction. So we use that and we kind of just synthesize our own training data by slicing them up to train this. And of course, on the FETA data set, it kind of works perfectly, right? But now if you look at now on real acquisitions from Mile, so Mile is a different data set um, 
And this is the, these are actual acquisitions, right? Um, even though the statistics of the motion are completely different to the kinds of uh, training examples that we work with, they do a pretty good job at, um, at you know, my our proposed method does a pretty good job at reconstructing the underlying volumes, at least sort of visually, I, I think this is sort of what you're supposed to expect, right? So, um, and we did a whole lot of kind of uh, quantitative studies to compare our method with sort of the current state of the art, which is um, the work of that uh, Jin Shen, um, the MIT uh, PhD student who just graduated. Um, and uh, we actually uh, do a lot better. So our motion error is kind of basically half that of um, his work in this single stack setting. So, um, but yeah, maybe I should kind of just full disclosure. So he wasn't working on this uh, single stack uh, case. So he works with three uh, or more uh, slice stacks. So probably this is not supposed to be, this method is not supposed to be used in this single stack case uh, setting, but nevertheless, it's a very promising sort of uh, result that we get. And, uh, but that's pretty much it. And I would like to just finish this by thanking all my collaborators and, uh, you know, mentors and um, uh, also NIA. So of course, um, I'm not getting support from NIA for, to, to work on feel, right? Because that's the antithesis of <laughs> aging, right? Um, but yeah, I'm still funded by NIA as well as um, uh, of my uh, mentors. Yes, thank you. Questions? Excellent. Um, okay. Are you planning to? So you you are doing a fair amount of interpolation. Oh, okay. We will depend pretty much on how well the images will align or not before. <laughs> uh, and you have your black volume, so you yes, I wish it. Um, uh, because this may be then later on used uh, for volumetric analysis. It's also the intention to inform what parts of the image are interpolated. And oh, yeah. So um, I guess sort of, you know, if you're giving this to radiologists to use, we have to basically sort of demarcate the regions that are interpolated, right? Because they don't want to look at it and they say, oh, you know, okay. Yeah, because we don't want to be hallucinating anything. Yes. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of for radiologists' eyes, but um, here I didn't show any of that. Yes. You can mask these things out, yes. You're the chair, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you're asking this question. Um, so the, the question then is, in your case, you're being explicit about the case that you are hallucinating something. But isn't that generally the case for all of the methods that are being used on these applications? They're still, you the misalignment of the data or the gaps in the data should be there regardless of the method being used. So it's more of a general problem than something specifically for you. Yeah, so I, I guess in practice, they will like keep requiring more and more slices until you sort of like, you know, have a good coverage across the entire volume. But, you know, so that's why this speed of the method is kind of, speed of methods is very important because if it's take, it's gonna take you three minutes kind of to reconstruct a single volume, then you can't, you know, you can't keep up with the speed of acquiring these slices, right? Yeah. <laughs> What sort of interpolator do you use? Because there, you know, there are many different sorts that trade off uh, support, you know, with the the blurring effect. Um, yeah. So, so in your case, what what have you found works well? Yeah. So I, I got very lazy. So the uh, interpolation you do. So there, there are sort of two components to this interpolation. So you have to kind of, you know, warp your slice stack using the, the, the motion that you estimated, right? So that is kind of, you know, you don't even need a, a fancy interpolator for that. We just use a box kernel, right? To just split, scatter the intensity information onto a single, like a, what do you call it? Like a common volume, right? And then sort of we use a, uh, a CNN actually to fill in the holes out of that. Yeah. And that, that is just kind of, you know, trained in a self-supervised manner. 
so that that kind of gets rid of having to you know um, hand engineer like the Lansage uh, three kernels and all of these things. Any other questions? Are there any questions online? Oh, uh, the workflow is the. Oh, no, this is for uh, Gentile. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have probably one, one last question. Uh, are you planning to, to use this methodology also to contribute to the problem of trying to have a super resolution? Yeah, so Eugenio has this sort of uh, um, uh, basically, you know, um, piecing together histological slices. So there uh, he had a postdoc who kind of just used an optimization approach to, because there's no, if you're doing histological slices, there's no through plane motion, it's all in plane, right? So he had, a, he had it a little easy, but, but um, yeah, there's plenty of other sort of opportunities to apply this to. Can we get another one?